it, it just takes nailing the right coach, and it looks like they got the right guy here with Barry Odom. You know, you're right. Sometimes that is just, it's not quite as simple as that, but it is as simple as that, right? And there was some, you know, they've done a lot to try to upgrade the football in, in terms of basketball. You have Cindy LaRock there, you know, who's great with the women's side. Uh, you were alluding to, you know, UNLV football with Barry Odom, who unquestionably was the right choice for, for UNLV. And I think most everybody thought that. Uh, just we didn't all think he was going to turn the program around in five minutes, right? Um, but he did it, utilizing some good players that were already there, good players he brought in, and being a, a better coach <laughs> and uh, somebody that's won on this level before. Yeah, and I, I feel like, and this is nothing, this is no knock of, about, you know, over the last 25 years of UNLV, but I feel like they're more in line from top to bottom. And a lot of the stuff that yeah. Odom is doing is stuff that Marcus Arroyo didn't. And I like Marcus Arroyo, but I think it's stuck in the craw of Eric Harper, the AD. And he laid out a bunch of things like being local friendly, being yeah. high school recruit friendly. And that's to me, that's one of the biggest things. Odom didn't come in with an attitude like, hey, I know what I'm doing. He actually listened yeah. to people here around the program and like, this is what you need to do to ingratiate yourself early on. And ironically, the – you're 100% right. And ironically, the guy who came in here with the most cred did the most listening, right? He won at Missouri, had seven win seasons there. Nobody else has come here for this job has done that, going all, unless you go back to John Robinson, who, of course, was a, a legendary coach. And, and to speak to your point even more specifically, if he didn't do that with the, with the, uh, with the list, uh, trying to get local players, would he have a quarterback right now from Liberty who is lighting things up and who has replaced a quarterback who got hurt and done a magnificent job? No, he wouldn't. Right. And uh, Maiva was a, wasn't a Royal recruit. Um, so it shows locals well, can, true. if they want right, to stay. That's a good point. Yeah. I'll, I'll give but, you that one. No, no, but, but, but his, his plan now is, because I think they've already gotten six local commits, um, and mm -hmm. the plan in the future classes is to try to get you know, at least eight or 10 guys local. And I think it's going to help build a program. The other thing is it's grassroots because yeah. then those kids want to go to the games and their brothers and sisters want to go to the games and their parents want to go to the games yeah. and other players want to go to the games. You got to get people out to the stadium too. That's right. And, and that scene Friday night that you were a part of, I was a part of, I was thrilled to be out there. You know, there was what, 25,000 people out there. That's not a massive crowd, but that's very good for UNLV. And they were enthusiastic and it was, People at least understood, enough fans understood that was an important game, and they came out there. And I'll just tell you, you know, this, it's such an exciting time. And, um, you know, I think most people have felt that if you could get the right direction, they've done a lot to try, you know, they've, they've improved a lot of facilities, they've done a lot of other things, and they needed that final piece of the puzzle. And that final piece of the puzzle was getting somebody in charge who was a solid head football coach who'd won at this level prior to it. And, uh, and right now we're living in a, a wonderful world. They have a, every chance in the world to be 10 and two, you know, yeah. beating air force is not going to be easy. San Jose state's a good team too. So beating them isn't going to be that easy, but they have every chance to win the mountain West conference and be in a, a significant bowl game. So Al, how do you learn? How does UNLV learn from Barry Odom and maintain this? Because the reality with success is that there's a chance that Odom yeah. does leave for a different job. But well, how do you maintain good, this if you're yeah. UNLV? What do you learn from Barry Odom to keep this thing going if he does indeed leave for a different job, whether it's next year or the year after that? Yeah, that's a very good question. I certainly hope he's not going to leave that quickly. I would hope not, but you never know. And 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 I think the thing that has to be learned is. Number one, if he raises the program to a certain level and the players stick around a little, the lesson you've learned is the next person you hire better be somebody like that who has won at this level before and can come into a program that is already winning. It'll be easier, too, by the way, because there'll be a program that is winning, playing at one of the best facilities you'll ever see in your life. So I think the lesson there is don't go backwards. Don't, you know, don't do a reach. Find one of those good head coaches like Barry Odom, who maybe won seven games somewhere, eight games somewhere, that they're going to want to come to this market and, and get here. And if they can do that, 
I hope he's here for at least two or three more years. I mean, that would be just spectacular, but you never know. Al Bernstein's on Cofield & Company on ESPN Las Vegas. All right, what are we getting tomorrow with Shakur Stevenson and the fight? Is that T-Mobile? Very interesting. Yeah, that is intriguing. You're right. I, I, you know, I don't know how they're doing with ticket sales. I hope well. Um, Shakur Stevenson is the terrific fighter, and the man he's fighting, Edwin De Los Santos, is extremely good, albeit a big underdog. I mean, according to a lot of the odds, he's like a minus 965, you know, nine, uh, uh, underdog De Los Santos, which is a lot. You know, Stevenson's like a, you know, a high favorite in his fight. And, uh, but, but that doesn't take away from the fact that De Los Santos is an exceptional fighter. He beat Jose Valenzuela, very good lightweight and an exciting fight. I did his last fight against uh, uh, Adorno, uh, in which he showed a new wrinkle. De Los Santos was thought of as a big power-punching lightweight. He showed us great boxing skills. Of course, your Chris Stevenson is a star in the sport, kind of on the verge of being a superstar, but he needs to put together big wins. And the question will be, you referenced T-Mobile. Will that have, is, you know, he's sold a lot of tickets at big arenas in Newark, back where he is, uh, where he's from. And can that, uh, you know, uh, correlate to selling a lot of tickets here in Las Vegas? I, I hope it does. What do you think of the philosophy of putting it during F1 weekend? I guess the thought is, hey, a lot of international fans, sports fans will be in town. Maybe they'll look up and go, hey, there's a fight. Let's go over to T-Mobile. Well, that could be. And, you know, boxing, good boxing matches always used to be, a lot of times, were during weekdays. And I, I think, I've always thought, it's not a bad strategy because, you know, there's lots of other competition on the weekends. You can, I think, the, you know, the, hey, I know this is going back a million years, but the hagler Hearns fight was on a Monday, right? Um, so I don't think that, and I, I think you're right, that part of it was the, you know, the, the idea that a lot of sports fans would be in here, maybe they'll go to the fight, plus they've marketed it, and ESPN wants it, obviously, on that night. So we'll see how it goes. But um, Chris Stevenson is certainly a marketable star in the sport of boxing, and it, just a, as a fighter, he is as skilled as you get. And I think the only thing that Chris Stevenson, as he moves on now, wants to do is, is be a more dominant finisher. I, it's not necessary. Floyd Mayweather, you know, made uh, $80 gazillion in his career, uh, and he was not a knockout puncher. wasn't a finisher necessarily. Um, but I think for Stevenson, that would be the only finishing touches for him as a megastar in the sport. Al, I want to move over to next week, a fight that you're going to be part of, David Benavidez mm-hmm. versus Demetrius Andre. That's going to be taking place at the Michelob Ultra Arena. Is this fight already solidified that the winner gets Canelo next at 168? The winner will likely get Canelo next or in the one after that. Uh, but you hope it's next. And I think it's very, very, very likely. You can never say anything for sure in boxing. We all know that. Um, and, and I think this is the right fight to say, who should get Canelo Alvarez next? Um, because Benavides has been the champion at 168 before, lost his title first through a failed drug test and through, you know, missing weight. So, you know, he had some, he shot himself in the foot a little bit, but he has really studied his life, getting, having a young baby and really getting himself and solidified and been a just a very very exciting and terrific fighter he is kind of acknowledged as the second best or best depending on how you think he'll do against canelo super middleweight andre a long time middleweight who has never gotten the big fight that he wants for whatever reason some have been his own doing some have been promoter issues some have been other things now has his moment to shine at age 35 in a weight division, in which he's only fought twice before. He is a very, very good and clever fighter who, by the way, scores a lot of knockdowns. He doesn't knock people out, but he has gotten many, many knockdowns in recent fights. So it's not as if he doesn't bring any pop into this fight, even though we know Benavides is considered the bigger puncher. I think this is going to be a terrific fight. And by the way, on the undercard, of that, uh, Subriel Matias against uh, Ergashev, 
uh, a fighter who is uh, an Eastern European fighter challenging Matias for his title fight, I will guarantee you 100% right now that is a going to be a fight of the year candidate. Al Bernstein is with us, boxing legend. All right, Al, we got about a minute left. I got to get your take on this one. I say in the long run, Fury and Nganu was really good for the heavyweight division. You know, it might be. Uh, that wouldn't have been my initial take, but it probably was in some. Uh, well, and Ganu, listen, did he overperform? Oh, my God. I mean, Fury underperformed. We know that. Yeah. But Nganu, and you know him from the MMA world extremely well, he overperformed. At the end of the day, it may have created another contender. And why wouldn't whoever wins between Usyk and, uh, and Fury, that's going to be in January, why wouldn't the winner fight him? Yep. And other, other, I mean, other real the, heavyweight that's boxers one of the should be salivating. Of the year that, you know, that he was able to do that against Fury, even with Fury underperforming. And Francis Ngannou is the 10th-ranked heavyweight fighter, uh, according to the WBC. So there's that, too. What do you think of that, well, And Yeah, so and, – and why wouldn't he be? Because guess what? He just went the full distance with Ice and Fury and lost yeah. by a razor-thin margin. Um, so, it, you know, there are miracles in sports. We, we the, the hockey team that beat the Russians many, many years ago – 